Good afternoon from my end. I know it's uh, different times for different people, but uh, welcome to the African Tea Time session today. Uh, my name is Damaris Choti. I work at the African Studies Center here at Michigan State University. The African Tea Time session uh, is hosted by the African Studies Center, and it's one of our signature events that is held biweekly. And the essence of the, the, the forum is to provide an opportunity for people that are from Africa or interested in Africa, do work in Africa, to be able to um, share, learn together uh, on different aspects of Africa. So today we're very privileged and happy to um, have our presenters, two of the main speakers are not new to Michigan State University or the African Studies Center. They're friends of MSU, I call them friends of MSU and friends of the African Studies Center. They've been able to attend our African Tea Time sessions previously. They've been able to visit Michigan State University. And we're really very pleased to have them here on this forum together with other contributing speakers to be able to lead this session. Uh, the, the discussion today, uh, it's going to be on sports and youth empowerment in Africa. And our main speakers or main facilitators of this session are Elio Dakanga, and Eliud is a youth development expert and based in Kenya. And our other speaker is uh, Francis Gichuki. And Francis is also a youth development and leadership expert, also uh, hailing from Kenya. They will be the main uh, of facilitator of speakers for, for today's forum. But we are also very pleased and happy to have uh, four contributing speakers from different parts of Africa. And Franklin Asuo is one of the speakers, and he is an institutional development practitioner from Ghana. We have Yanga. Yanga, I wouldn't try to um, pronounce your last name. Please do when you have a chance to speak. And Yanga, somebody, please, can everybody try to mute themselves? So Yanga is a community sports coach uh, from South Africa. We have Mustafa Sulman a youth mentor based in Egypt. We have Pauline Msungu, who is a young woman leader and women football player from Kenya. So these are the six, um, six, please, can everybody try to mute themselves? These are the six uh, speakers that we we'll have for this forum. Uh, Vida, can you please mute yourself? But anyway, as I, I'll take care of this as the, 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 the discussion is going on, I'll be keen to meet the members as they're doing in. Thank you. I was able to meet them. So what I'm going to do right now, before I hand it over to Francis and, and Eliud, uh, we are going to play the AU, the African Union National Anthem, to start us off because we care about our unity as Africans. And uh, for a moment here, I'm going to share my screen. And we play that song together. After that, then we can offer this time to the speakers to lead us through. Um, Hoping that my screen will show. Can can you see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. Yeah, but I think it's loading. Looks like it's loading. It's loading. Let's try to play it. And... Is it playing? Yes, it is. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. I need to do a full screen and then hit so Let us all unite and celebrate together the victories won for our liberation. Yeah. 
Wow. I love that anthem. I think it speaks to so many aspects of <clears throat> being as Africans. So I'll stop sharing and give this opportunity to Francis and Elliot to take us through the discussion. So I'm going to take the back seat. The two will be facilitating the session and then we'll um, group back together after the, 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 the presenters have gone for us to continue with the discussion. So please, Francis and Elliot, thank you so much for being here and thank you for accepting to lead the discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Damari, for that uh, great welcome, that great remark that you made. Yeah. And um, it cannot be any better than let's make Africa a tree of life. And, and that tree of life is, is, is really what is very natural to us in Africa. And it, in instance, the fact that we all in an African setting, when you're having our tea, often than not, we sit under a tea. Mm -hmm. When critical decisions in Africa are being made, there will always be a tree around there. Even the medicinal processes, and there is a story of a tree here in Kenya, when you have mom, you are told to uh, carry some tree, some firewood, Go around around that tree seven times. And on the seven times, you run away and you don't look back. And you'll be healed. There's so much about the African. There's so much about the African tree. Allow me to invite you in a small way. You know, um, I don't know what it is, but I found this interesting. Um, you know, and it's just made of paper. Just made of paper, this one, just paper. And you can have it in different forms. I said, let me carry it along with you today. And ask you a question too. When you are a young person, what did you spend most of your time? What were you doing as a child, as a youth? What activities have preoccupied yourself? What are you doing? What was happening around your homestead, you know, in your neighborhood? What activity were you very involved with? And you remember one? But even today, you really enjoy doing it. A story is told of a young man at his early age, stayed around the home. He kept on moving far away from home to join other young people to play in the neighborhood. From a football made from paper. And you could play the whole day, the whole evening. And sometimes you forgot to go and return the cows back home. Of course, when you get home, you get some little training. And where, how did you leave the cows? You go and eat in the neighborhood. But you could have fun playing and enjoying and team, teaming up with, with, the, with the friends. This was the opening in life. But in that team up, there was an opportunity to be a leader. There was an opportunity to go to school. There was an opportunity to provide leadership at home, to be able to provide leadership in the region of Africa and globally. My name is Gifuki Francis. And as Damari said, a youth development and leadership expert, spanning over 25 years. Actually, I started when I was 12 years until now. And we are here today because there was an opportunity. And this year, myself and Elliot came uh, down to the United States to visit some of the young people who are young as 12 years when we started the mentorship journey with them. And they were graduating. And I see some of them here, I'll give them a chance much later. They were graduating, some with PhD, some with master's. 
And that journey is where we met and discussed with MSU uh, under the leadership of Damaris, is it possible to look at Africa representation in terms of sports that has propelled many of them into the space of where they are? And the African Sea was a perfect place to be. And today we are here because that's the reason that we want to navigate through. Look at sports and look at the youth empowerment, and specifically in Africa. But we're also going to have opportunities you know, to hear um, that later on, but also harvesting from other experiences across the world. I have captured all the, have traveled in all continents, you know, inspiring and empowering young people. And there's so much story to talk about. So I want to invite you today, at this uh, particular time, to journey with us in this African setting where there are no powerful presentations, but just storytelling, listening to what people are saying. As you see a cup of coffee from Africa. When you think about sport, what comes to your mind? When you think about empowerment, what comes to your mind? When you come about youth, what comes to your mind? When you got this invitation on your inbox or Facebook or wherever you got it from, what really struck you and say, wow, I want to participate in this event because I, I love the sport, I love the youth, I love the empowerment, or maybe you love Africa. It's something. And we do hope that in this session, we are going to take you through the process. And where you still have questions, we are here to converse and also hear experiences uh, from, your, from your end. I would like to invite Elliot to help us unpack the theme that we are discussing today and take us through also across Africa to hear the conversation that the young people and the old people have had over the years across the region. So Elliot, I want to invite you to share with us uh, and unpack the process of how we're going to facilitate the session. Welcome Elliot. Many thanks, Gishuki, uh, for that elaborate introduction and uh, ushering us into the uh, session uh, tonight, this morning, afternoon, from whatever time zone you are plugged in. Um, thank you so much. Um, uh, it's always uh, incredibly thrilling to be part of the African Tea Time of the Michigan State, uh, uh, Michigan State University. And um, uh, just to begin as off, I think I'll again repeat my name so that I can pronounce it um, the way it should. Um, so my name is Eliud Akanga. Um, as to what Akanga means, um, the research is still ongoing. But uh, Akanga is an African name. Um, uh, as Damaris uh, alluded to it earlier, I am a youth uh, development expert and um, I've been in this sector, um, inspiring and uh, mentoring young people for the last 23 years. And it's all out of passion. And um, perhaps that's one of the reasons we want to share our insights and experiences uh, on this forum. Um, I am based in Kenya. Um, Kenya is my home country, um, of course, in Africa, in what is increasingly uh, being called the Global South. Great. So. Um, Having said that, um, Africa has 54 countries um, based on the um, United Nations uh, official uh, statistics. And, and so it's a continent that really um, have us, you know, a huge population. And according to UN, again, um, Africa has the youngest population in the world and 70% uh, of the Sub-Saharan Africa, um, the people there, uh, uh, are below the age of 30. Okay, so that is statistics that is found in, on, on the United Nations um, uh, re records. And so you, you, you can now realize um, this high population of young people um, is, is quite key in driving the development agenda and specifically attainment of the sustainable development goals. And therefore, sports has emerged to be a very powerful tool mobilizing young people, you know, and bringing them together and supporting them 
so that they can align to their development needs and even needs of the continent. And that's why we want to share stories from across Africa. And we thought um, the best way would be to put that African setting uh, where tea is shared. Tea is, African tea is usually premixed. Okay, yeah, it comes premixed. You don't brew it as, as you drink, it comes premixed. And we thought we should get experiences from across different regions uh, of Africa. And that's why we've drawn in um, uh, contributors from North Africa, West Africa, South Africa, and East Africa. And all these are networks that we've worked with uh, in the youth sector. And so we are happy to present them so that they could also share their experiences and you hear from them um, what they've um, seen, done, and delivered. Um, we shall have um, a, a four-tire uh, kind of presentation. Um, we will be getting to know how or what are the foundation, foundational, um, fundamental foundations of a sports um, or youth empowerment organizations, what, in, what they entail and, and what happens there. We will then listen to the quality, qualities of a coach. And the coach is a person who works with young people in sports and trying to support them so that they, they, they can achieve their goals. We will also listen to um, a, a contributor who will give us um, the roles that sport has played in terms of crisis, in terms of distress. We'll, we'll get to hear that. And then finally, we'll get to, uh, again, one of the young people who has been uh, through the process as a participant, as a, um, a beneficiary, and also grown through an organization, and then also become a coach. Uh, before a coach, she was a player, and she still plays, played for the Kenyan national team. So she has combined all the four aspects that we are trying to bring to focus. They are combined in her presentation as a person through storytelling. So please relax. Um, it is not very academic. I mean, it is a relaxed um, uh, process. Um, usually in Africa, when we take tea, ordinarily we would be under a tree, as Gishuki has alluded to it. Sometimes we'd be around a bonfire. Uh, some of you call it campfire. And so it's really a, a time to reconnect, okay, and just reflect on our issues and not really a very, very, very uh, thorough and very strict moment uh, for anything. So thank you so much for that. So to kick us off then, um, we shall be uh, taking tea from North Africa. Um, before North Africa, we'll start with West Africa. I know West Africa is known for uh, what we call cocoa or cacao, but this time we'll get to sample their tea. And so I will usher in uh, Franklin. Um, he will also introduce himself very well. And then he will talk to us about, um, you know, fundamental foundations of um, sports and youth empowerment organizations. You're welcome, Franklin. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you, Gichuki. Thank you, Damaris. Hi, everyone. And nice to meet you all. I'm a Ghanaian and I'm joining from Ghana. My Ghanaian name is Pabna, and that means a male child born on Tuesday. My same name is Esio. Esio means river. And when I started schooling, my teacher gave me the name Franklin. Yes, yeah, so Franklin. If you like, you can add a Kwabna issue is, is my name. I am working in the uh, Sports for Development space. Currently, I'm the county director for one of the Sports for Development organizations in, in Ghana. Uh, I have passion for youth development uh, and have a lot of experience and expertise working in this space, particularly around institutional development and how it relates to um, sports and empowerment for young people. I'm happy to join the Africa Tea Time today. Um, 
I will, I will, I, I, I want to share tidbits of uh, some of the foundational stones uh, for a sports for development and youth empower uh, empowerment uh, organizations. There are many of them, but I'm sharing just a few of that, about three of them um, for for today. And I would like to start off by talking about uh, an appealing sport, an appealing sport. You, you need a sport that young people have passion for. Uh, you know, passion controls uh, behavior. Passion controls our behavior. And young people have a lot of passion for um, different kind of you know, sports. It could be soccer. It could be volleyball. It could be tennis, etc. Depending on if you like the country, um, the region, or setting that define uh, themselves. And for Ghana, for example, there's a lot of passion for soccer. Ghana is a soccer nation, so that's not as I mean surprising. There's a lot of passion for soccer. And so soccer has been one of the sports that has been used immensely for uh, uh, development in, in Ghana. And when we talk about the sport, really, it's not only the game per se, but you know the, the, the things that come to mind, for example, when you talk about football, the personalities involved, the players, Lionel Messi, Cristiano Ronaldo, and of course, some of the coaches like Pep Guardiola, etc. The perceptions that come to mind are things that are appealing to young people. And so you find some of them wearing jerseys with, for example, Messi's, uh, the, the position that he plays, number 10 at the back of it, or his name written at the back. You you hear some of them call their uh, mentors, Pep Guardiola, in relation to uh, the coach of Manchester City. These are the things that inspire uh, young people and they become avenues for uh, you know rallying them and you know talking about things around their developers. So for example, you want to play football, you want to be like a Lion and Messi. Let's talk about career development. So then interventions and things related to that are put in to empower young people. What does it mean to uh, grow a career around football? What if you don't end up becoming football? What are the options? So we are talking about career development here. We talk about leadership. We talk about discipline. We talk about how you need to be strong before you can play football. These are the opportunities that sports, you know, avail to develop um, young people. And the governing bodies of various sports are beginning to realize uh, this great opportunity offered by sport for empowering young people. So, for example, FIFA, um, in 2010, when the Men's World Cup was held in, in Africa, FIFA used the opportunity to build what it, what it calls football for hoop centers in several African countries. I think about 20 of them as a way of empowering young people. What is in these football for hope uh, development centers? You have an astroturf where young people can come and play football. But within this football for hope center are libraries. You have IT centers. So young people, they come in there with a passion that sports bring and they as a rallying tool, but they also get opportunity to read, develop their numeracy skills develop their quantitative skills. They get the opportunity to be trained, IT, digital equity. These are the avenues that sports brings for the development of young people. And not only an appealing sport, but you also need the vehicle around which you develop or you roll out these interventions. So the second thing that you will need as a pillar for a sport, a youth empowerment organization, is a coach, or if you like, 
coaches. You know, young people like to learn from their mentors. They imitate what they do. They want to become like them. And so this opportunity is used in sport as a tool for development. So you would want to have coaches. These are people who have passion for the sport. There are people that young people look up to as role models in the community. And they roll out the interventions that um, you want to put in, in, in young people. They live in the community with them, so they're able to develop close relationship with them, help them in their development, help them in mentoring, help in guiding them. So you need coaches. And a lot of sports for development organizations are nonprofit. And so they develop this tool a lot. Volunteer, the coaches develop the, uh, volunteer their time in, in communities and, and they're able to mentor young people. Uh, the other thing that I want to talk about is about networking. You know, the UN says partnerships for development. In the sports for development and youth empowerment arena, is is the same principle. You cannot be an island, you need to network. There are a lot of sports for development uh, um, communities out there that you need uh, to be to be part of. And there's that growing an awareness among sport regulatory institutions about how powerful sport can be used as a tool for development. So for example, the Olympic Committee, uh, UEFA, FIFA, these all have foundations where they give back to the community uh, to support the concept of sport uh, for development. And so you want to connect uh, with them. And if you take football, for example, uh, you have one of the biggest charity in the sports for development arena, the Common Goal Community, that harnesses um, funding within the football sector and gives back to the community for, or for development. So these are entities that you want to connect with. And there's several advantages of that. You benefit from funding, that is one, but that's not the only thing. You also benefit from um, training materials. The organization that I work with now as country director has benefited immensely from Common Goal and some of the materials that uh, we, we have uh, benefited from uh, training materials. There's this popular material called Football 3. It's a unique way of playing um, football and something that young people like a lot. And it teaches about you know, women empowerment, um, gender equality, inclusion, and things like that. And so you get to network and benefit both by way of funding, by way of sharing experiences among peers, and also training, um, yeah, the, the aspect of training. And so in summary, what I'm saying is that you need these three foundational stones, an appealing spot, you need the coaches, you need the networking within the sports for development, like sports for youth empowerment arena uh, to be able to function and function effectively within um, the community or the space that you are putting in your interventions. And there is a growing awareness about sports that is as a tool for empowering young people out there, particularly among sports regulatory institutions. You have a foundation, FIFA Foundation, the Olympic Committee, and they're giving back to support uh, the community. Mm -hmm. and so the opportunity is out there to tap into um, this uh, available resources for an effective um, intervention among young people uh, in our communities. And you over back to Eli. And some tea from Ghana. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Franklin Aslo. Yeah, for the uh, very nice tea from Ghana. Which city are you plugging in from? Yes, I'm in Cape Coast. Ah, Cape That's, Coast. That's uh, close, close to the coast, the southern part of Ghana. Aha, uh -huh. great. Yeah, those who, those who um, studied the history in yeah. the 80s, uh, like Kichuki and myself, 
you know, the, the, the cap cost very, very well and what activities went on there. So thank you so much. <laughs> now, um, we have a, a, a brief opportunity for the audience, just in case you have a question before you go to the next contributor, you could be having a question or a rejoinder or a query. Uh, you, you'd like, uh, Franklin, to elaborate on, perhaps you didn't get something properly. We have about five minutes uh, for that. So if you're there, then you can raise your hand uh, electronically. Uh, Damaris will, will help us in uh, picking whoever is doing that. And, uh, and if that can't happen, perhaps uh, your gadget can't allow, you can still raise it uh, physically if, if you are uh, on camera. So there, there, there's an opportunity for questions to Franklin. And, and Elud, I was just adding, if somebody wants to add the question in the chat, they can as well do that. Yeah, sure, sure. Please, if you, you can type, please go ahead. Uh, it will be responded to. Thank you. Any questions? As we wait for questions, um, there's some something that captured my attention as um, as Franklin was um, presenting, and and at the beginning he mentioned that uh, passion controls our behavior. Uh, do you remember that? Passion controls mm -hmm. our behavior. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's it's a key the key element to remember. And uh, so, what kind of passion do you have as a young person? I know there are so many young people who are plugged in um, in in the session. From different uh, time zones. So, as a young person, um, what passion do you have? Okay, and because passion, we've just learned controls your behavior. So, one is a result of the other, and 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 then we are talking about youth development, and here it is positive development. It's 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 not uh, any other development we will be talking about. So, um, the kind of developing the development we are talking about is positive youth development okay so just keep in mind that uh, if passion controls our behavior then um, the two have to really be connected well otherwise if there's a disconnect then we lose um, the, the ultimate goal the end game then changes let me use a sports uh, term the end game changes so perhaps there's any hand somewhere it may be early um... go ahead yeah, just something uh, on addition to what Franklin was talking about, um, you know, uh, an appealing sport. I think that's very interesting. It's an appealing sport. These organizations um, are founded on that on that pillar of of of, of what sport exists uh, within the environment where you are coming from, and and, and the, the organizations. Um, if you look at in Africa, the first five. You know, uh, sports that are very popular. One of them is football, and it runs from south to west to to north. Everywhere you go, the football, either the, around the house, you know, on the, in the field, or you know, uh, wherever there is a possibility, you will find football. And interestingly, rugby is also very popular in Africa. And rugby is very popular played in Africa, and and I think this has a lot to do with the later on with the um, uh, when we, we talk with the, with the younger from Southern Africa, rugby has been, Kenya has been very strong. I think they're also going to, to the Olympics uh, um, next year. So, and, and rugby is quite a strong uh, sport. Cycling. Now, this cycling, I need to know if it's the one, uh, uh, Pesas and Tony, that we are all doing ar ar around the, the border border. Is it the same cycling? But because in Africa, there's a lot of cycling. And I think uh, even in history, you know, yep. they, you know, for people who had abilities, yep. uh, the first thing they could get was a bicycle. And yep. I think in Africa, yep. some of them are a teacher yep. who always had a bicycle and was very respected. So maybe cycling has picked this kind of case. It's very strong. Athletics, you know, comes number four around athleticism. Mm -hmm. uh, athleticism as a sport um, is very strong. And I think Africa has a very competitive sport in terms of long distance. And we are catching up very fast on short distances too. And, and then cricket, 
it's also very strong one of the sports in Africa that is also you know you know there and the cricket you know a lot of it as because mm. of the history coming from you know India Asia but also it's really a strong sport in Africa so this is something just to add on uh, when you come about the appealing sport and these appealing sports mm. are very uh, important uh, to the foundation mm. uh, because if you brought a sport that's not mm. popular and appeal to young people then they will not be in there yeah. just alone. Mm. Yeah. And, and, and I know, and, and to add to that, Chuki, uh, in Africa, particularly Cameroon, I understand that one, one of the indigenous sports has to do with uh, wrestling. I think is it Cameroon or Senegal, one of them, wrestling. And this is something that a lot of young people uh, have passion for. And it's one of the indigenous sports uh, that has survived, you know, all these um, foreign sports that have been introduced in the past. It's still something that a lot of people have passion for. And so, like I mentioned, depending on your setting, uh, there they, they could be passion for one sport or the other. And, and, and like Elwood uh, emphasized, passion influences our behavior and in the context of sport we are looking at positive behavior so once it's a tool that appeals to people they have passion for that they hear the name of one of the players and they are inspired they want to be become like one of them zero see ronaldo messi so how can we use this passion to talk about your development to, go, to talk about your career. So we are looking at the positive aspects of passion in relation to sports and empowerment Thank of you. young. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Franklin. Um, you had uh, Gishuki mention football. Um, I just want to correct this in case you're based in the United States. Please do not confuse it with the American football. So we have to be sensitive to the, <laughs> the yeah, various soccer. sports across the world. You know, the, the audience is mixed. So it is soccer. He was referring to soccer. Yeah. In Africa, we mostly call uh, soccer football. So when yeah. you're in Africa and you hear someone say football, it's not American football. It is yeah. soccer. So, okay. yeah, so, so yeah. That, I think that is okay. Um, I just want to read one comment. I um, uh, can see there are a few comments here. Just finish up with them and then, um, hey, yeah, we have Jan, uh, okay, Jan Ducrast Rusiga. Oh, and he says, uh, yeah, he says the uh, uh, attractive sports like football are producing orphans, orphans? As sports due to media and branding of soccer. I wonder what could be, what could we do to have ruggers marginalized on the limelight? I don't really understand the question. Uh, Franklin, do you? Not clear. It's not clear to me. Jan, could you just unmute yourself and uh, and uh, and ask the question? Yeah. Jan yeah, Plus? Sure, 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 sure. All right. Uh, normally, he said passion control our behavior. And uh, when you consider in sub Sahara, we're having a lot of sports, and soccer has taken all the media, all the branding. And uh, as a scholar, I was wondering what could we do? We have often sports caused by all the investment that is inputted into soccer media and the, com the, the communication techniques of the Olympic Committee that has put soccer above other sports. What could we do as a youth empowers to have the often sports like uh, rugby league Rugby Union, MMA, because he was speaking about wrestling and the wrestling, the, the African nation that is doing a lot of wrestling is Senegal, because they, they are producing people that shift and go into other sports and get into the limelight. 
I was wondering if he, if he has a sort of a idea that can help us bring the other sports upwards. That's what I was right. thinking of. Right, uh, thanks. I get a question now. Uh, in fact, there are several things that uh, could be looked at. One of them has to do with, you know, national development uh, agenda of like frameworks that can push this other sport upwards or to the limelight. You know, sports as an industry requires a lot of investment. And so a lot of money is going into football to develop the game, to develop the um, you know, athletes and all the clubs or academies that are being developed to train uh, professional footballers for the game. And so if we want to get these, what you call orphan sports out there, then there got to be that intentional uh, arrangement at the national level, you know, as a sports authority at the national level to target specifically these other sports that uh, we think young people have passion, but somehow uh, they are not well uh, developed out there. And apart from looking at it from the national level, I think that you know, passion and the things we see around football, you know, Olympic athletics and all that, it's also the way the game or the sport is promoted at the grassroots level. If you go to our Ghana, for example, right from the basic schools through to the second cycle schools to uh, the tertiary institutions, you see facilities for football. So we have football fields. You know, we have the academy, you have a school soccer team. But you can't say the same for these other sports, in fact, for some of them. And so deliberately, we have relegated them to the background and even the very early stages of, you know, introducing them to, to, to young people and the youth. And so we need to be looking at that at those levels. Once they are introduced, Earlier enough, you will have find some um, young people who are expressing interest, um, you know, to go into uh, those kind kinds of sports. But I also think that it also it's also a lot of you know the games and these days the way they gravitate from just being passion oriented to a whole career and livelihood thing. So. Young people, for example, those who do this professionally, are asking themselves, apart from soccer or these other sports that are in the limelight, what future is there for me if I go into this kind of sport? Which is why I'm saying that we need to deliberately um, channel resources and efforts to developing this, not even only at the um, local or national level, but internationally, so that you don't have a country or a nation that's you know, channel so much resources into developing a particular sport, but internationally, it seems like the returns um, is, isn't that much. And so it should be a collective thing. At the Olympic level or whatever level, this advocacy and discussions need to go on so that there is a progression, not only um, from local to national landline, but then internationally, if you go into that sport, uh, you can have... Uh, a future. I'll give an example of women football in Ghana. Ten years back, you know, a lot of parents will not encourage their uh, their children from into uh, going into female sport because at, at the national level, attention has not been given to it. But gradually, we are shifting from that. Now there's so much attention for women's sport. We used to have only men's uh, World Cup. But now we have women's World Cup. So if I go into women's soccer in Ghana, for example, I know that internationally I can make it. I will also give an example of referees. In the past, I mean, officiating is all mostly among males, male referees. But we all saw what happened uh, in the last World Cup. FIFA, for the first time, has introduced female referees. 
So if I'm going to refrain as a female, I know that there is a future out there. If I start in Ghana, I can go internationally. So these are some simple examples we could look at and, and, and tailor them into developing whatever kind of sport that we want uh, to, to develop. It, it should take a collective effort, not only nationally, but globally, to be able to uh, champion uh, this uh, so-called orphan sports to the land. Thank you. Thank you uh, uh, so much. I hear you. you talk about collective um, efforts um, in, in order to you know, bring to the limelight the orphan sports. Kijuki, do you have, it uh, looks like you, uh, I saw your hand. Just a, just a summary and a, a good question, a very powerful question. And, and I think the conversation okay. today is leading us towards, you know, sport and youth empowerment. And um, the conversation would be also looking at the United Nations uh, sport for development and peace, which we celebrate every 16th of April. You know, and why do we celebrate this? Is because we acknowledge that sport has innate power to transform lives and more so to bring peace and development. And, and therefore, in this conversation, uh, we would be looking at more how can we utilize as sports for development organizations, you know, multi sports approach. So it's not just one sport we are using, but we're using multi sports. There are many in the community. And I think when you look at, for example, even tug of war, you're looking at the physical activities that also promote well-being amongst young people. Then the wrestling, the traditional um, uh, sports and games will be part of this process. And I think when you look at uh, what was happening you know, traditionally, then that is supposed to be brought to life through the march for support. But again, this has to be put into context by the organizations, which are uh, for non-profit organizations that are community-driven in appreciating what you call the sport for all. Sport for all means that it's also more inclusive, uh, that everyone else is able to uh, participate in it. And you bring in a space that everyone can bring in whatever they have uh, that they can be able to do. And then that will help a lot uh, from what uh, uh, the colleague had asked, how then we promote other sports. And, 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 and not all sports have to be at the highest elite level. It is how much can this sport translate into the life, into a better life of the community. And for this purpose, the young person. You know, they, we have got a lot, the MPC of football or the, 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 the inclusion for sport. How can this be brought, brought on board? And, 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 and being aware that not everything uh, that, that, uh, that is part of the sport has um, a, a platform that can reach the, the, the very greatest, the highest level in the world. And I think that's where, you know, the question of uh, the media coverage of different types of sports, you know, elevated to mean that there's nothing else happening on the grassroots. That is our role as organizations that are using sports to empower young people to bring it up. And I think uh, it'd be good and interesting maybe uh, as maybe you come to the you know the end of this conversation, sort of hear a bit of other people who have gone through this process, and they can be able to share uh, their experiences um, uh, in terms of how the organization has been able to activate uh, the change in the world and what force is being used. Thank you. Uh, Eli, okay. if, you know, if you see Festus's his hand. Uh, Eli, okay. Ah, okay. Uh, Festus, yeah, yeah, I see it. Festus, uh, you have some remarks? Yeah, thank you so much for, for this opportunity. And uh, you and the rest who, had, uh, who have convened this meeting, very special meeting. I've just been attracted by the question with regards to sports, soccer being so famous, thereby rendering some other sports to be called orphans. And I wanted to contribute towards that. Uh, first of all, I join my colleagues who have also especially uh, Shuki, saying that uh, we can have multi-sports multi approach to address this situation where we don't really focus just on one sport to be the most famous. Because, you know, when we focus on one, then others who are not very good in this particular one, for example, the football, will feel like they're left out, they're discriminated against. But when you have the multi-sports approach, 
then it's more inclusive and it carries everybody together. However, more specifically, I want to remind our colleagues here that soccer did not just come famous once it was conceived. There are so many activities that had gone around soccer, investment in marketing, branding itself, creating the brand visibility, and then delocalizing, delocalizing sports, the soccer itself to, to, to gain the common touch at the local, the very grassroots level. This made it so much famous. And I think like the same approach, the same mentality can be used to bring more other sporting activities like athletics, cycling that you're mentioning, uh, the, the indoor games, you know. And once we delocalize this and make them attain the local common touch with the local grassroots levels, and then we invest a little bit in marketing. Marketing here does not necessarily mean TVs and a lot of money. It's just a question of making the word of mouth and starting the community and more, doing a lot of strategy, strategized uh, mobilization with that particular sport. Then all the sporting activities that are counting can come up and can be very visible in the sports arena. Uh, it is that we like, you know, associating with what is already established. We like, you know, starting to be seen in what is already established. I want to challenge us that we can also bring these other sports forward, bring them up and make them be visible. Let us do a little bit branding and then have the common. And I agree that uh, the theme of tonight's discussion is really strategic how sports can influence the youth development. And you started so well the story that the analogy that Gishuki gave was typically who I was in Oxia. I would go out to the field, tie the cows in the bush and go play soccer because I wanted association. I wanted to team up with my friends and come back late by 7 p.m. The cows are not back home yet. So I, okay. I start being ready for the you know for the punishment. But at the end of the day, I'm happy that we play in the field. So you grow up having that kind of notion and association, you know. The one thing is involving in sporting activities determines how you think, determines how you grow up, because it brings on board other people with whom you share a lot of common, mm -hmm. I mean, you okay. know, a lot of commonalities. You share dreams. Okay. You don't just play soccer. You also talk and say, we don't do this and that. So if this is this are well channeled. Then becomes a better avenue through which youth perception can be changed to be very positive. We can visualize their thinking and make them harmonize to achieve their goals. It's a way that can make people achieve their dreams. It's a means to an end. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Festus. That's very nice. Hello. Multiple sports has been, has been mentioned. So if you played hide and seek, please be sure you played a game. I would want us to move to the next contributor. Just if you have a question, somebody was asking, I don't know if it's Margaret, just yes, hold it's... on it a bit. Okay. Um, uh, so, that, so that we move to the next um, contributor, we will still have some time at the end um, so that we listen to what you'll say. Some of the questions we may want to put across could be answered as he speaks, All right? So now from the Cape Coast of West Africa, we now go to uh, South Africa. Okay. Uh, I don't know whether I know your accent very well. South Africa, uh, if that's the accent. So we'll be hearing from Yanga. And um, Yanga is, 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 is a coach and um, he will uh, introduce himself and he'll talk uh, about um, what sparks youth transformation and what does he do? What is his role? What does he encounter? What does, he, um, what does his day look like? Yanga, if you can hear me, please uh, bring the South African tea and tell us what Yanga means. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Greetings and uh, good evening from my side of the world to everyone. Let me greet you in a South African way and say Molweni, Molweni Nonke. It's an honor to be here in this African Tea Time conversation. I'm bringing tea proudly from South Africa. It's called rooibos tea. So rooibos is a type of herbal tea that is made from leaves of the rooibos plant, which is a native to South Africa. 
So rooibos, the name is Afrikaans, uh, which is one of our 12 official languages in our country. It is spoke, spoken mostly in Southern Africa, and it was derived from a form of Dutch that came with the Dutch settlers in the 17th century. So directly translated to English, rooibos is red bush. It's a red bush. So today I want to take you on a journey and talk about the transformative power of coaching in the world of community development. But first, let me start with what could perhaps be a thought-provoking quote. A, in a region where empowerment is the key to progress, coaching serves as a catalyst that unlocks potential and drives change. So I'm Yanga Zilishe. So Yanga comes from a prayer. It says, Yanga Ingosi, may the Lord bless. Uh, it comes from a prayer that is very much uh, repeated within preschools. Zilishe is my surname, uh, Dr. Damaris. I forgive you for really struggling with the pronunciation. <laughs> there. At least I, I didn't I, try. I didn't try. I knew I was going to push it, so I said no. <laughs> okay, Dr. Tama. in African comprises of 16 countries, known for, among other things, the unique rooibos tea. Uh, and just as rooibos is a native plant that thrives uh, in our region, I also believe that empowerment is the native soil in which development blossoms. And and like how, however, like any space where you find development, it's, it's, it's a very complex space and, and the development sector faces a lot of challenges. And I think coaching, and I might be putting myself out on a limb here, completes the picture of actual So myself, I have spent eight years on the soccer field, both professionally and semi-professionally. And during this time, I've come to realize the profound impact of what a coach or the profound impact a coach can have in one's performance, right? So I've had good coaches. I've also had coaches that did not very much work well with me. I don't want to say they were bad coaches. I'll rather say they didn't work well with me. We didn't gel well together. And coaches create the environment uh, for one to thrive. And in my experience, having worked with good coaches and the ones that I haven't really worked well with has given me an appreciation of the power of a coach. And then also just the realization of how my performances, the same person, how my performances changed depending on who the coach was. And I've seen this not only on the soccer field, I've seen this in the world of work. In the last decade, I've immersed myself in, de in the development sector where my journey has been akin to the soccer game as well. It's been marked with goals where I've had coaches who've come alongside me, helped me set goals. And that's what a coach does. It's been marked with assists. I have also graduated to a point where I've been a coach myself, coaching others, helping them, assisting them in reaching their own goals. And yes, facing the occasional hurdles, the inevitable failures, and challenges that come with life. So I think those sports, in all my experiences, I've found sport to, to be a powerful tool or coaching within sport to be a powerful tool for me. And I think coaching for sport in the sport for development space can also, also has the power. And I've seen this uh, experientially of how sports for development has the power to transform lives of young people in my environment. 
some who might not have been maybe academically inclined, but might have had the passion that my colleague Franklin talked about, which drove the behavior in them to want to participate in the sport. And in seeing them come to sport and gain the benefits of sport like discipline and I've watched lives being changed in that space. So if you think of the development sector, it is a realm where the pursuit of global progress meets complex challenges, as I've said. It's where individuals, organizations, and communities are striving to address pressing issues that they are faced with, issues like whether it's poverty, whether it's education, health, or sustainability. And a coach in that context becomes a guiding force. It, a coach is someone who helps individuals to realize, as I've said earlier as well, and I'll come maybe repeat this quite often, helps one to reach their full potential. A coach offers support, they offer mentorship, they offer guidance, they help one identify strengths and weaknesses. They help you even develop plans towards goals you have set with them, they provide constant feedback for you that is necessary to even keep you in the journey, uh, sticking to the goals that you have set. So I think they are vital in navigating challenges and achieving desired outcomes. And in my personal journey, I've also, as I've said earlier, been blessed to have two coaches. And as I was reflecting on this talk, to think, which coaches would I want to highlight? I go back even to when I was playing under 15. I had a coach called Vusi. Coach Vusi, we called him. Coach Vusi used to instill a belief in my skills and technical ability. He would always, whenever I got the ball, would encourage me to dribble past players. And even when I failed, he did not give up on me. He'd encourage me and say, do it again, do it better next time. This is how you can do it better next time. And that instilled the belief in me that I've got this and I can do it, right? I've also had another coach, for example, a coach called John Latham, who was our reserve uh, team coach, head coach, when I was playing reserves to the pro side of IX Cape Town, and he was the assistant coach of the first team. When I got promoted to the first team, I remember sitting with John Latham in his office and him saying to me that if it was up to him, he would have promoted me a year before. And I was only 17 at the time. To think this is someone who saw potential in me and even before I saw potential in myself, and when he said those words, it gave me more impetus in wanting to move forward and strive uh, and do more. So it really has, coaching really has empowered me to overcome my own obstacles or obstacles that I have faced, like self-confidence, for example. I've had coaches who even have helped me with contractual disagreements. Uh, they've also helped me create or build a perspective towards failure or what would others call failure, for, for example. I remember one coach who used to say uh, to us, one bad game doesn't make you a bad player, you know? And that in itself uh, created a perception around uh, a failure that made you want to try again. So I, I also watched the other day, watched the TED Talk, and, and and the speaker in that TED talk was saying that, you know, a coach, a coach is someone who introduces you to your own greatness, right? It's someone who he, he even makes an example, an interesting example. He says, if you if you ever met a successful businessman who had amnesia and forgot who he was and came to you as a coach, would you try to teach him business acumen or would you try to help him come to an understanding of himself? And he says it is it probably the best thing to do in that space is to help that individual come to himself because when he does, the rest would fall in place. And I think of the coach to be someone like that who helps you also understand what's already in you. Uh, because I don't think coaches have the power to put things in you, but they have the power to draw out of you things that already exist in you. 
and fine tune them and making you better. So as I've said, I've, I've, I've had firsthand experience of the impact of coaching in my life, not on the soccer field, not just on the soccer field, but also in the world of work, in the development space where I work today. And I've seen how this has led to positive outcomes, even in projects and initiatives that, that I've been a part of, where I've had good mentors and good coaches along the way. And I, and, and I can cate categorically say that coaching has the power to drive change at community level. You know, you think of, uh, so when I, when I transitioned from the football field into the office, for example, I was introduced to early on this concept of a grow, of a grow coaching model, right? Which is a widely used framework to unlock potential and possibilities in the development sector. It, it, it provides a structured approach to goal setting, reality checking, options or opportunity seeking and a way forward. And I'm sure, I'm sure you guys would know that far better than I do. But having undergone or having had coaches take me through this structured way of developing has helped me achieve some of my goals that probably I would not have had a framework to guide me through it. I've also in turn have turned back and used the same framework in helping others come up. You know, so coming from a position where I was coaching participants today, where I coach coaches who coach those who coach participants, and to see those uh, stories happen uh, for me is quite it's quite it's, it's quite encouraging, and, and and I think a testament really of what coaching can do and its ability. To, to really impact our lives. But all of this, I think, for me, lies in, in trust. You know, trust for me is the cornerstone in that coach-participant relationship. It, it really plays a pivotal role if you talk about unlocking potential and guiding behavior, you know. So if you think of trust, trust between a coach and their participants creates a safe, supportive environment. It, 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 creates an environment where individuals feel comfortable to explore their, their own abilities, set ambitious goals for themselves, you know, and, and see if they can push boundaries because they are in an environment where they feel that they are trusted. You know, trust allows for open communication between uh, the participant and the coach and allowing the coach to provide even constructive feedback to the participant themselves, you know. And participant also in that space of trust is able to receive this feedback because they trust the coach's intentions, not just the expertise of the coach, but the coach's intentions. You know, I've seen for me coaches or that or that trust in that coach participant relationship, uh, uh, as I've said earlier, seem to 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 the point I mentioned around my coach, coach John Latham, who believed in me before I even believed in myself and how that caused, a, even how that was a, a powerful motivator for myself as well, just inspiring me to strive for excellence even in that space. You know, we, we maybe it, it, we, we, we live in a community or my community in general, which is quite, this is quite prevalent, where you find that kids, or young people uh, are seen and not necessarily heard, right? And and when you have kids who have a very, a very trusting relationship with the coach where they can also speak, express their views, they, are, they become kids who, not, who are not just seen, but they are kids who are heard. And this affirms them, you know, and being acknowledged and valued you know, enhances your motivation as a person and, and, and as in, in your self-worth. So, so in summary, for me, I think trust trust to be a very, very pivotal, very pivotal point. I think trust between a coach and their participant is a foundation for unlocking potential and guiding behavior and nurturing personal growth. A coach's belief can serve as a catalyst to, to self-belief while being heard and seen for me, enhances a, a participant's self-worth. 
So coaches really do build the necessary trust for me that becomes the enabler for one to perform at levels that maybe they wouldn't necessarily, didn't necessarily perform at. So I urge you all to consider the role of coaching in development for it holds the key to progress, empowerment and transformation in our communities. And maybe let me end off with the quote that I that I started with when I was starting to speak. The quote that says that really in a region where empowerment is a key to progress, coaching serves as a catalyst that unlocks potential and drives change. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Yanga. In which city are you now? I am in the city of gold, Johannesburg. Ah, Johannesburg. How far is it from Sekokune? Sekokune is right around the corner from me. It's right Brilliant. next door. You can throw a stone yeah. and it will get there. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. It sounds like Kenyan. So thank you so much. Um, to the audience, I, I would request that you reserve your questions. Um, up to towards the end because we, we would want to jump to the next contributor in the interest of time but thank you younger for uh, giving us also the journey from a player younger a young player also called younger and then now to a player a coach then a coach of coaches so that's quite a, an elaborate journey um i'm sure there are questions that will come around uh, that, that that dimension so now um i would want to hand over to gishuki um, Gishuki will be ushering in the, uh, the next um, contributors um, if, uh, after a brief introduction, of course. Uh, Gishuki, back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Elud, and thank you so much, uh, Yanga and um, Franklin, on the laying the foundation. And I also hear now also laying um, trust uh, in, in the coach. That the trust is critical. But what I loved a lot was a coach his potential in a, in, in a young person before the young person sees the potential. Now that's really a powerful statement that we want to navigate through. But um, allow me to invite um, someone who has gone through um, the moment sometimes which we don't like talking about. A moment that sometimes we never predict. And um, I remember the last time I was in a meeting in, in Lyon, France, I was doing a presentation about uh, the refugee crisis in Africa. And I think that day we said, everyone, anyone is a potential refugee. Anyone is a potential refugee. And, and the crisis can come at any time in your life. You know? And, and um, Mustafa, you introduce yourself and share with us how has sport played a key role in your in, in, in your journey uh, all the way from south from Sudan as a refugee now based in Egypt? Mustafa, you have your few minutes to share your story. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Yes, we can. Okay, good. Uh, first, I will say good evening, everyone. And my name is Mustafa. I'm so happy for giving me a chance to share my story as a refugee living in Egypt. Uh, today, I want to share with you on how sports have empowered and inspired me as Mustafa throughout my challenging journey, offering hope and resilience. Uh, when I first arrived in Egypt in 2013, left my mother and my father, my siblings home, I felt lost and disconnected from my home country. And you know how that, how that feeling is when you feel lost and disconnected from your home country. So, however, sports become a universal language that broke cultural and linguistic barriers. So I'm in a new country. I don't know their culture. I don't know their language. 
So this also was kind of the challenging for me. When I started in sport activities, it allowed me to find myself. As I connected with fellow refugees, we shared similar experiences. So together we formed teams, playing football matches, and build a sense of unity, sense of trust, sense of love and respect for one another. So from this experience, I also ran, learned the physical and mental toll of being a refugee can be overwhelming. So however, sports become an essential outlet for me to forget the traumas and maintain my well-being, also to forget the hard times, the war that I've been through in Sudan in 2003, until now is taking place. Uh, also engaging in physical activities, not only improved my physical fitness, but also released the stress and the next city. It provided me so much, it provided me much needed escape from the hardship of my daily life. Sports also, sports icons, I have example like sports icons, like Eduardo Camavinga, Real Madrid player, I think all of you may know him. Alfonso Davis, who plays in Canada national team and also plays in the football, uh, FC Barmin football club. So, and their stories of success become a source of inspiration, inspirement for me. Hearing about athletes who overcome their own challenges, setbacks, discrimination field, my determination to preserve and succeed against all challenges. Also three sports, I acquired essential life skills and developed a newfound sense of confidence. Playing football or playing sports in general taught me the importance of teamwork, discipline, and leadership. So these skills have not only helped me in the field, but also helped me in my normal life, including education, personal relationship, and future, and future career. Uh, sports also have the remarkable ability to break down social and cultural barriers by participating in sports events and competitions. I had the opportunity to interact with people from different backgrounds, from Eritrea, from Somalia, from South Sudan, from Syria, fostering mutual understanding and respect. It, it helped me challenge stereotypes and promote fun, active inclusion in the community. I mean the refugee community. Sports also helped me Sports have played a significant role in my integration into the Egyptian society. It, it really helped me to integrate in the Egyptian society. Through the local sports clubs and organizations, organizations like, like Terry De Zom and which are implementing sport for, for development, sports for protection, they call it TDH, Terry De Zom, and also Save the Children, and so many organizations and local clubs, I had the chance to connect with Egyptian youth, fostering friendship and promoting cultural exchange. These interactions have been instrumental in bringing the gap between refugees and the host community. So I don't want to go along. In conclusion, or at last not the least, Sports have been an empowering force in my life as a refugee living in Egypt. It has provided me with sense of belonging, physical and mental well-being, inspiration, skills, and opportunities for integration. As I continue my journey, I carry the lessons learned from sports, reminding myself that resilience, determination, and unity can overcome any challenges. Last but not the least, I want to say Adidas. Remember these words. I want to say Adidas. When I say Adidas, that's, I don't mean Adidas, the, the company of sports uh, materials or something like that. No, 
this is the logo that is my favorite logo I use it. Adidas, to me, or these words, it's a version for all day I dream about soccer. Remember this, Adidas, all day I dream about soccer or all day I dream about the sports. So I use this abbreviation as my, my, my favorite logo. I don't want to go long. I will say thank you so much for listening to my story. And I hope it inspires you to recognize the transformative power of sports in the lives of refugees like me. Thank you so much and God bless you. Uh, I will pass the ball to Elliot. No, I mean, I will pass the cup of tea to Elliot or Gishuki. Thank you so much, guys, and God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mustafa. So much, Mustafa. All days I dream about sports. Wow. <laughs> All day I dream what, about what? soccer. All day I dream about sports. Exactly. That's a powerful statement, you know, and that power of sports, that power of soccer to, to, to bring resilience and determination. And, and the last time I was having a conversation with you, uh, Mustafa, up in, uh, in Cairo, I remember your dream, you know, that one day you really want to say your story to the rest of the world. You want to inspire the world. And I think this is the opportunity. And I think you told me last day, mm, now you have a passport to travel around the world, inspire the rest of the world and share your journey. And I think I want to appreciate uh, that. There will be questions. I think it will come to the next level. Uh, please keep your question uh, for Mustafa. Um, he didn't know at what age he left uh, Sudan. And uh, his family now is in uh, Cairo. He has two children, I think. I just saw them the other day, beautiful children. So that would be nice. Maybe a question for him later on. Allow me to bring in the last. Uh, some just, just some little time to share with you uh, a short story of a certain girl in a certain community. Also don't know the girl, also don't know the community, but at the end maybe we'll get the, the girl and we'll know the community. Okay, uh, it's a story about um, a little girl uh, whom I happened to um, to know about her story and to understand about her life a lot. Okay, there, there, there was um, a girl in a certain community and uh, this girl was just a little girl in the community and the girl actually comes from a very uh, humble background whereby um, she comes from, from a family that um, her father, her father was uh, the breadwinner of the fam the family, but then the father uh, got an accident. Then um, the father, the father happened to be uh, amputed. The leg was amputed, and he was the only breadwinner of that family. You can imagine how uh, life turned out to be in that family, and specifically to that little girl in the in the in the family and in the community uh but uh this lady in the community uh liked playing football with with other little boys in the community so while playing football she she could sneak out of the uh out of home to go play football but again coming back of course she'll be beaten because um the parents uh, the parents perceived football to be a male-dominated uh, sport, and it they they could not allow the lady to play uh, football and more so playing with men. But lucky enough, the girl um, happened to join the school team while she was still in primary, studying in primary level, and um, just because she had uh, developed interest in playing football she joined the school team and later on while she was finishing her primary education she was scouted to join a secondary a secondary school where she was offered a full scholarship to study from uh, form one to form four 
the the girl again joined the uh, high school. She was offered the scholarship. She she uh, she was offered the talent scholarship to study and play for the school. So she, while in the school, she was also again um. Be she was given leadership in the school. She was the captain of the school soccer team, and during the four years, she led her team from uh county competition level to the national level to the East African level. And all those years while she was in first form one to form four, they won the national title and the East African title. Again, in the high school level, this girl was still, was still playing while well, studying. And uh, lucky enough, she was performing in class and performing in the field. Again, she earned a scholarship to join a university. This lady, this lady, you can say she was lucky because uh, if you can look at her journey, it was just unfolding with scholarship, scholarship. So joining the university level again, she was given the leadership as the uh, university's soccer team captain. During the four years, first to fourth, uh, she led her team uh, to the national level, to win the national level title, East African title, and this lady was uh she she pursued bachelor of bachelor of commerce, uh bachelor of commerce, purchasing and supply chain management, in the University of Masinde Muliro University of Science and Technology in Kenya. Uh the lady has been playing football for so long, and besides uh playing for the school team while at home, this lady happens to join the uh Sports for Development Organization, where she learns different um, leadership skills, life skill education. She undergoes mentorship programs. And all along, the lady has been into the program and she's been also uh, undergoing football coaching as her talent continued to develop. And uh, while she was in the community, Sports for Development Organization in the community, she was, she was also a uh, since she was performing very well, she was also uh, a good player, professional player by then, and she has been earning call-ups for the national team, Harambe Starlets in Kenya. The lady has played for the Harambe Starlets. The, the lady has, uh, she's a, a football player in the midfield, and um, when, when, when she's not in the field playing, this lady also coaches her young, um, her young people in the community or in the organization. She, besides uh, undergoing different programs for capacity building, she also gives back to the young people in the organization as a coach, as a, a mentor, and as a, a, a sports coach in the community, let me say that. And uh, in the community, in the organization, she happened to join a program in the organization called uh, Bundesliga Youth Ambassador a program that was in Kenya for some time during Corona era. And uh, this lady has undergone the training with the Bundesliga coaches and uh, other fellow coaches in Kenya. And she's been doing a great work to lead other young players in the community. And I can also say, besides being a coach, besides being a coach, uh, she was also selected as an International Olympic Committee Young Leader to represent uh, Kenya. And uh, as we speak, she's still um, a young leader, an International Olympic Committee Young Leader representing Kenya. And she's uh, running a program that um, works towards advocating for and promoting gender equality in and through sports in the community. Actually, the ladies, um, giving back to the community on what she actually got from other programs in the uh, community, community and in the organization. And as we speak today, that lady is me, and I'm called Pauline Musungu. And uh, maybe just before I wind up, I'd like to share an inspiration about myself, just a little bit of it. Okay, if, you can see here, I have a cup and this cup is black. 
in color. But then I'll change the color of this cup. Okay, uh, if you can look at it, it's changing slowly. Uh, uh, can you see it clearly? Yeah, the picture there, that's my picture. Uh -huh. On this side, there is a uh, Beyond Sport Kenya. That's the program that I'm running. And this picture, actually, this cup inspires me every morning I take tea because uh, once it's not poured, the tea is not poured in, it's black. But when I pour my, my hot tea inside, it turns bright and it tells me like your life is very bright and you've come from a very dark, uh, a, a very dark part and you are now going to uh, a very bright uh, part of your life. And that's how I always motivate myself and I move on every day. Thank you so much. And I take my tea from East Africa back to Francis Gishuki. Wow, 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 wow. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just a story that you want to listen and listen and listen more, you know? Uh, also, the time is ticking and ticking and ticking and ticking, you know? I wish the time could just stop that you could listen to this depth of transformation that sport can do. And, and um, allow me, we have a few minutes to ask for real questions and conversation to open up more conversations. But when I was um, looking at the African continent, there are six sections normally in, in Africa continent. One, normally East Africa which has 14 countries. You talk about West Africa, where our school is coming from, 15 countries. And talk about North Africa, you know, seven countries. Southern Africa, where younger is, um, there are 10 countries. But also we talk about Central Africa. I've also picked a bit of the other countries from East and South, and we have nine. But the sixth region of the African Union is called African in Diaspora. And the African in diaspora. And um, there are many of us here, so, you know, in diaspora, who are also African, and they have a story to tell. I want to invite someone I went to visit for his graduation in Florida. And Anthony Gitte is in this space. Gitte, Anthony, I give you uh, three minutes just to share with us. How do you find yourself in Florida? And what is the role of sport in your journey? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Gishuki. Yeah, so it's uh, 4.40 here in Florida. So good evening from Florida. Uh, my name is Gite uh, Gadiru. And my third name from Ghana is also Kwabela. I was born on Tuesday also. So uh, yeah, I'm a Kenyan by birth and by nationality. I come from the Rift Valley in a county called Transoya. And I'm proud today to say that Gishuki and Pauline are part of my community back in Kenya. So as much as we're in diaspora, we are still rooted to our home. And I'm happy to have you here today and to join you today. Yeah, so I will share a little bit about myself. So I am uh, first born in a family of uh, three boys. We are only men in my family, apart from my mom. And uh, I'm the first born in that space. And uh, growing up for me was more of uh, being indoors and spending a lot of time indoors because I, I love my indoor space. But uh, after my primary school and uh, getting into my high school, I started to venture a lot into sports and arts. And that not only gave me a platform to be able to connect with other young people, as we talked about by different speakers, 
but it also opened up my world to realize that if I want to grow beyond my home, beyond my safety nets, which is my parents, my siblings, I had to go beyond just thinking about the immediate people who are my family. And that's how I found myself into sports. And I remember this one day I went to the soccer pitch where there was a tournament. And that tournament happened to be a tournament that was hosted by Francis Gishuki. It used to be called Gishuki Cup. I don't know that you remember that, Pauline, those days. And when I went to that uh, event, I thought, okay, there's a lot of sports going on. But beyond that, I saw something different beyond just the sport being played. I saw a lot of uh, mentorship that has been talked about. I saw a lot of coaching in session, which has been talked about by Yanga. And that really inspired me to get into what Kishuki and Eliud and others who are like-minded had in mind around the power of young people. And that's how I found myself uh, volunteering for TISA and Sports for Development Organization that is proudly founded by Kishuki and Eliud. And that is where my leadership journey in sports began. And I remember uh, Gishuki and Eliud, there's a time we were traveling to Uganda. That is back in 2010. And I was the youngest. By that time, I think I was about 14, 15. Yeah, turning to being a, an adult. And I was tasked to, to lead a group of young people who were even older than me. Some were 18, others were 19, 20, 24. And I was the youngest. So that really uh, sparked something in me that indeed these mentors saw the passion and the leadership in me, which is something we've also talked about today. How a coach can see things within you that you cannot see. So fast forward, that is how my journey began. I went to Uganda, came back to Kenya, and I was inspired to take on a leadership journey. And I grew within the space of uh, TISA, the Sports for Development Organization in Kenya. And I went through the ranks of being a volunteer all the way to heading the organization when I was just turning 23 years old. So that is how my life was fast paced. So at 23, again, I was having the responsibility, shouldering the responsibility of leading an organization. And I was young. I was still figuring out my life as a young person. But that taught me a lot because I remember Gishuki once told me that you cannot fit into my shoes, but you have to come with your own shoes. So that's what I did. And that has always been my philosophy anywhere I go. So today I am proud to say that sports gave me the space to be a leader and the motivation to grow beyond my safety pace or my safety net. And what do I do today? So currently I am doing a PhD in uh, anthropology at here at the University of Florida. And my research interest, as you might see, is pretty much influenced by my background. So my research interest currently is uh, working on sports development, policy and models, trying to see how do we understand sports? And I think uh, Mustafa mentioned something about sports being universal. And that's what I'm trying to see. How does sports come in in terms of being a uni as a universal concept? But at the same time, how do we understand sports within the particular context of cultures and communities that we come from? So you can see how sports has really influenced the person I am today. And besides that, I, I teach an African language here. I teach Swahili. And not only that, I teach cultural anthropology. So trying to see how do we connect our language, our linguistics, our cultures, and using the power of sports to be able to articulate all these things. So today I am very much proud to join into this conversation. And my challenge to all of us is to try and see how can we leverage as young people, as practitioners, as scholars on seeing how do we leverage on the space of sports for development and sports as a whole 
as 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 a as a knowledge production space, so that we can all share our expertise, our experiences, and our knowledges as Africans, as people who are inspired through sports to be who we are today and to be where we want to go tomorrow, the next day, the other day. So let's get that inspiration just as Pauline has shared, waking up every day, what inspires you? Let's think about that and let's push forward on learning a lot from sports and development. Thank you, Gushuki, for the time. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Tony. Um, you don't have to sit in my shoes. The easiest you can do is come with your shoes. <laughs> and that's how it is. And, and thank you so much for, for that sharing from Florida. And um, I want to get back to Elliot um, with questions that could be there as we come to the wrap up. Um, Elliot, there are questions, uh, comments from the, um, the audience. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, yes, we just have about 10 minutes left uh, before we wrap up. So uh, we'll pick just a couple of questions. But before that, I'll go through the, uh, the, the chat uh, just to see um, uh, what insights are there. Okay. Um, right. I'll go up to, I think up, up to Franklin, we had this. Uh, okay. Yes. I think the newest was from Maslin Jepleting, who said uh, soccer is much more popular in the world. And I think she grew up knowing that. Um, uh, this is in response to the orphaned sports. Um, uh, Professor uh, Lips, I can see, says uh, before that he says he said Bosisi. Bosisi must be is it a meal from South Africa, or is it a drink? Um, and then, of course, in response to yes, yes, Professor. it's a Swana name for bush tea. Uh -huh. bush tea. It's Swana <laughs> name for bush tea. Thanks, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I hope you have some, uh, you carried some to the US. <laughs> I now, had some this morning. <laughs> ah, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. You also said about uh, Sun and Cape communities uh, had rainbows way back. This was in response to um, uh, Yangas, Yangas uh, fact that is, is from Cape or something. I think so. Then Jaira Samunga, thank you so much for your comment that we need to entrench uh, the sports in our curriculum in schools and also you know, just have games of passion, engagement, uplift young talents. And, and he's mentioned some of the often uh, sports like uh, tennis, uh, golf, okay? In Africa, golf, we think is for the rich, but it shouldn't be the case. Okay, um, then um, the next comment is, um, Okay. Um, people are happy about uh, inspiring story from uh, Mustafa there. Uh, that's Professor Lepeta from Michigan State University. Uh, Vaida also inspiring sports and powerful transforming tool. Um, okay, that's okay. A, a lot of applause from applause from um, uh, the audience to Mustafa and Pauline. Okay. Um, Jaira Samunga says, Pauline, that's very touching, encouraging, and the sky can never be your limit. Touch the lives of those vulnerable children. Thank you for the good job, uh, Pauline. Um, um, Mary Maseno. Mary Maseno is my teacher at, at Park University. And uh, she says, uh, great testimonials on how sports and have transport, uh, transformed the lives of young people, the role of sports in youth development, and the need to explore and create awareness on other games. Okay, again, the orphan sports there. Um, okay, uh, Mustafa, good job. Um, Brother Anthony for sharing your story. Yeah, and those are the comments so far. So maybe you could pick uh, two questions or so uh, as, as we wind down to the end of the session. But I would want to start with the question that was pending after Franklin spoke. Perhaps that one has been fermenting for so long we could, if it explodes, we can have it and then get a couple more. Yes, I think that was Margaret Oho. Yes, uh, Eliud. Uh, for some reason, I can't even raise my hand on this thing. 
So, um, so good evening, colleagues. Um, I don't know. Good morning, wherever you are. Good, well, good afternoon. So this is a, this has actually been very nostalgic because I've been part of the Taisa family for a very long time. I'm one of those people who grew up in Taisa. I can speak this even in confidently because of the mentorship I got in Taisa. You'll be surprised I was the board chair. Not so many board chairs speak in this man about their organizations, you know. They give direction to the organization, they're learning from the organization, but I was really mean, learned a lot from Tyson. So this evening, I'm also excited to see Tony. I mean, the rest will speak on the side. So uh, my question was about, not, it wasn't really a question, but I wanted to make a comment. And it came through the experiences of um, Pauline and, uh, sorry, the guy, <laughs> the guy who spoke about his, uh, I don't know, Mustafa, yes, Mustafa. There's something called intersectionality that will come out very academic because I'm an academic. And I think this is one thing uh, as we, we we program, I mean, at the grass, grassroots levels, we need to understand the concept of intersectionality. That is to say, the youth that we are dealing with do not have the same starting point. And that, that is one thing we need to allow the youth, first of all, to know. That's why one, one, some youths are privileged, some are not. And why is, it, this, why is this important, especially for the leaders and those of you who are running the organization? It's because, you know, when you are a youth, you have a lot of energy and you think you can just sprint and you go. But your circumstances differ. And that's why some youth will, will, will pursue, will do just one thing or the next, they're out there. And in the era of social media, it is important for them to know the system, systemic discrimination the question around why is male football more financed than the female football, it's not just, it is a deep issue, deep rooted issue. And those are the conversations we need to have with the youth. Why? You'll be surprised the youth will come up with a solution to this. So when they don't know they're walking around, they're just walking around with passion alone, and yet the, the system is strangling their passion. And they're not aware. So they're wondering what is happening. Is Gishuki against me? Is Eliud against me? No, they don't understand the broader societal, you know, so that is one thing the youth need to understand and it also needs to be reflect in the programming. And then also, um, uh, yeah, because sometimes um, it's it's a deep issue. Uh, I hope one day I'll be able to, we have a lecture around this because sometimes even when uh, um, the, the, um, the leaders themselves, they might mean very well in their program, programming, but in a subtle way, perpetuate societal discrimination unknowingly because they are not aware of this discrimination and marginalization and how it 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 it, uh, it it is reproduced in the society and also most importantly why we speak about youth and empowerment i think the use or the issue of mental health is very important we should never stop those conversations especially in this era i think it is one of those things uh, that we need to talk about more uh, prominently and lastly younger I'm also having my robust tea <laughs> because I'm in Jobang. We should catch up some time. So yeah, thank you. That is all. Thank you, Margaret Monyani, uh, for that. And Margaret is also a PhD and she works at which university uh, in South Africa? South Africa? <laughs> no, I don't know. I, 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 I teach at VETS. I came here to study my PhD, which I finished. Um, yeah, uh, and I'm based in Jobang. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. The, uh, Damaris, what do you think? I can see we have only five minutes. Um, um, I think if... Should if, we take one more? Sure, we can take... I'm hoping that people can allow us a few more minutes to just take a, two yeah. questions. It's been very, very fascinating, and I understand that's why it took longer. And I, I mean, I can stay here longer, but I don't want... because. At least it's four, yeah. it's four to five here, but others is after midnight even. So maybe yeah. two, yeah. three more questions. Um, I think two, two will do, two uh, so that uh, those because some some will be going to work tomorrow, so so that we don't mm -hmm. keep them so long. Yeah. So um, uh, who has a question? And as a question comes, uh, Professor Lips has also shared uh, a link in in the chat which will take you to the African arm of uh, global advocacy for physical activity. You might want to uh, appraise yourself and read that uh, at your own later time. So please participants, just, just take note of that. Yes, if you have any question, please. 
Elliot, I could actually add that it, 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 just just to say how how much I really appreciate the opportunity to interact with all of you today. Um, I think we need a lot more of this type of um, uh, activities, and I'm, I want to thank Damaris for facilitating a session like this. It was very well attended. Uh, the, the reason I shared that link was to say, you know, the University of uh, I'm a Northwest University in South Africa, uh, which is in Posh's room, um, has is facilitating this African network for fiscal activity. Uh, one of the things that I enjoyed listening to are the experiences from all of the, the you know, all of the presenters, including the young people who have used sport uh, to find meaning and to connect communities. Um, in Egypt and elsewhere. I was really, very, very excited to hear that. So physical activity and sport, you know, it sometimes is intentional sports structure. Sometimes it's just activity as in let's go play games, uh, you know, pick up games. Those actually offer enriching experiences. And I want to say that let's continue with the conversation and find opportunities to, to share. Uh, for those of you who are in the United States, let's connect, let's find each other. And, and continue finding ways in which we can continue collaborating. Uh, sometimes it's going to, uh, to meetings or arranging seminars, similar to what Damaris is doing. So just to say, I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to sit here and listen. Labs, would you want to introduce yourself? Just oh, what you do. Okay, okay. Yeah, yes, yes. Um, I am actually um, uh, based at Michigan State University. I'm, I'm an associate professor of sport and exercise psychology. Uh, doing research on youth sport and youth empowerment. Um, I particularly have interest in use of life skills from sport to the, the youth development outcomes. And I've had some experiences working with colleagues in Kenya, some of the projects we have done in Kenya, uh, also projects in Ghana and Tanzania and Botswana. And Damaris and I were in Botswana last week as part of this youth empowerment um, initiatives with an MSU delegation. So yeah, um, I'll be happy to help to learn more about what other people are doing uh, to see how we can build synergies between all this type of work. So I do teaching research and outreach work, and you will always be recruiting talented students from the continent mm -hmm. who want to come to MSU. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Professor Maleti. Back to Elliot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Maleti. Um, yes, a very good and uh, elaborate comment. Maybe we have the last question now. If there is, if there is, okay. Uh, if there isn't, I think I'll go straight to my parting shot. Then I'll hand over back to Gishuki. Um, um, for me, this is a very uh, passionate uh, topic, and I would just urge all of us to to keep the narrative going because once we put it into a narrative, it means to move from one place to another. And I would really want to touch on what Jan, Jan Christ said about the orphan sports. Create a narrative around it because a narrative gains momentum and before you know it, then it's a community of practice and, and what was not known becomes known. Uh, one of the participants, Festus Juma from Homer Bay, Kenya said, even by word of mouth, it doesn't have to be a sophisticated uh, kind of advertising or marketing or branding. Just word of mouth, create a narrative, talk to people in your stories, wherever you are speaking, mention something about that. The way we like mentioning about sports for development, youth, we combine that and sports. And, and, and it has become a narrative. And for us, it's a community of practice where people now put conversations that converge ideas, ideologies, insights, and then the space is, is visible. So thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, in my other life, I also consult for young people on uh, uh, employability skills uh, on a World Bank project and Kenya government, um, uh, in a project called Kenya Youth Employment Opportunities Program. And there are several experiences there, which again, in a different forum, we might want to share and see what that is doing. So thank you so much, and back to you, uh, Ishuki France. Thank you so much, Elliot. And uh, parting shot is good to come from um, our regions also. So you have a few seconds. Uh, and I want to begin with uh, Franklin, with your parting shot, and then hand it over to any other person you feel you'd want to do that. And then finally, I'll do a parting shot before I hand over to, to Damari. Franklin. Right, Gishuki, thank you so much. Thank you, Elliot. Um, 
And so I would want to say that, I mean, institutional capacity is really important for um, empowering young people as far as uh, the concept of sports for development or sports for empowerment is concerned. And so remember uh, to have an appealing sport because passion controls our behavior. And here we are talking about positive behavior. Uh, let's think about the coaches because they play a key role in the networking because a lot of the regulatory bodies of sports, like I mentioned um, UEFA Foundation, uh, the Olympic Committee, um, FIFA, have recognized the importance of sport for development and they are giving back to the community to drive this noble agenda. And so there's opportunity out there to tap into these resources for the privilege of our underserved youth and for purposes, for purposes of empowering them. So uh, let's take note of that and we will do a good job out there. Thank you so much, Kichuki. Back to Kichuki. Thank you. Um, just to suffer before I come to Yanga and I think to the Pauline. Yanga, you are muted. Uh, sorry, Mr. Gachuk, I thought you said you're starting with Mustafa. My apologies. Uh, but for, for my side, just as a parting shot, thank you for the invite to this conversation. Um, I'd really, as, as Prof have said as well, said you would like to see the conversation continue. Uh, one would like to in a way, listen and be part of conversations as they continue going. But I, I thanks, thanks for the opportunity. And again, just want to stress the point that says coaching really is it, a catalyst for, for change and, and definitely something worth looking into in unlocking the potential of youth in our spaces. So thank you very much. And thanks for having me. Thank you so much, uh, Yanga. I remember the last time you were playing at night in that safe hub, you know, in Joburg. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, come to Mustafa, the parting shot. Can you mute your mic, Mustafa? Mustafa, you can speak. Something, something not working from Mustafa. I think the mic is not operational. It's appearances. Um, You're having difficulty you. hearing. Yeah, I hope... Sorry, we are. Uh, we can't hear you well, Mustafa. Maybe as you sort out your mic. You can hear me. No, we are struggling. We are struggling to... Pauline, let Hello? me let me go let me go to Pauline first and they can back. Hello, can Mustafa. you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. No, we can't hear you, Mustafa. Just allow me to go to Pauline as you sort out the mic. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Francis, again. Uh, I'd like to appreciate each and every participant of today's conversation. Uh, it was so inspiring to hear from different uh, speakers, to hear from different people, different stories. And from the inspiring stories, I believe we have the potential uh, of building the future that we we'll want to see. So let's uh, build the future that we we'll want to see tomorrow together. Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much, Pauline. Uh, thank you so much. Mustafa, are you, are you ready? Uh, you still have my challenge. Yep. Uh, can I talk? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you for giving me a chance to share you my personal story or my personal experiences. Uh, this meeting is also inspired me. Like I learned many things from you not to give up in my journey. I learned two things today from Yanga and Gishuki. Yanga said, one bad game doesn't make you a bad player. And Gishuki said, you cannot always fit in my, my shoes. So try to bring your own shoes. So I learned from this and I wrote it in my notebook. I will not, <laughs> I will not forget this anywhere. I keep it in my mind. Thank you so much. I'm so proud of you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mustafa. Anthony, you're the one who brought the issue of carrying the shoes, your own shoes. Please. <laughs> Just a, a statement to conclude. Thank you very much. Yeah, my parting shot would be thank you so much for having me as part of the conversation. This is interesting. Let's keep the conversation going. And lastly, let's leverage on the power we have in order to generate knowledge for us and for others. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony, and thank you so much, everyone. Uh, from my end, when this opportunity was presented to us uh, by Jamari and the MSU African Studies Center staff, we felt it is not about me and Eddie. We felt it's about Africa. We felt it's about the people who are doing great stuff on the grassroots level. And we went out to invite everyone. We only sampled four from the, the four regions of Africa, but there are many, many young people. There are many organizations doing great things. And that knowledge, as Tony says, could be harvested to inform and inspire um, our work in the area of uh, sport and youth empowerment. So we want to thank you so much this opportunity, Damaris and your team, take this back to the MSU staff and, 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 and share our appreciation that you could trust us to be able to do this together. And um, we are, under some would say, the coach will always see something good in a young person before the coach sees, before the youth sees that. I think that's the role we are playing myself and Elliot, facilitating processes and giving our young people shoulders they can step on and see uh, many, many miles away in the new horizon. And this platform uh, is a powerful one. How I wish and we hope that the African Tea Time becomes our daily activity and have more of these uh, processes. And maybe not only in the MSU platform, but maybe also within our own African context when we are having our conversation. I'm a facilitator of positive youth development. I've spent a lot of time on this. I'm a mentor and a coach about young people and their development processes. It's about all investing, trusting, and journeying with young people. And I'm available for this around the world. Damaris. Wow. <sighs> What would my, be my parting shot, really? I mean, personally, I want to begin by saying that I've been touched. As a person who is not in the sports field, um, you know, for most of us, for most of us that are not um, in this field, you would think uh, sport is good enough for exercise. When you hear about sports, we, my, my colleague Leps here is in kinesiology. But if you didn't really take time to interact, to learn more, we all know that just sport is good for exercise. But look at what we've learned here tonight. I, I'm telling you that um, it's been very inspiring. For me as a person, I, I think tea time is a place that I always love to be. It has given me connections. It has helped me learn more about Africa, outside Africa. I will tell you I didn't know so much about Africa, being in Africa, as I have. 
facilitating these African um, tea time sessions. I've been able to engage with people from all parts of Africa, especially, and from all parts of the world in some way. And I've grown as a person, I've grown as a Pan-Africanist. I, I will tell you I have connections everywhere in Africa, including Tunisia, Morocco, places that you would think not so many people um, from there may, may be engaged outside their, their own communities. So um, just to know that a uh, sport is not just for exercise, that's my learning today. There's so much, there's career development, development of life skills, teamwork, patience, uh, you know, uh, tolerance, self-confidence. And that, that was testified here today by the, our young people that you all have been able to mentor. You, you can't tell, they're very eloquent. They, they, they know what they want, they know who they are. They, 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 they're, very, they're very self-confident. And uh, I, I just want to, to, to say, out of the conversations that we've had, it's, it's all about what you've been able to teach them through sport. It could be who they are as, as people, we have personalities too, but I mean, I'm 100% sure that you've been able to guide these young people and, and your work actually speaks through, uh, through them through the, the way they've presented themselves here tonight. And I want to thank you so much, uh, Gishuki and Eliud, for being able to expand this discussion and including our four other presenters, that's uh, Pauline, Yanga, uh, Mustafa, and uh, Franklin. It, this has been really, really very wonderful. Uh, and, and for the most part, when I facilitate these tea times, I talk a lot because you've seen Eliud and Gishuki talking a, a lot. But I've, I've sat back, actually, I've, I've listened. I had an opportunity to listen. You know, when you're facilitating, you're here, there, trying to make things work, reading the comments and all that. I, I just sat and listened, and that was really uh, wonderful to me because uh, I wanted to be here fully, and I was. Learned a lot. All those um, uh, learnings, who was that? Mustafa. I had all those notes down myself. I'll, I'll bring my shoes to every opportunity that I would think the shoes are too big to fit. I'll come with my shoes. I wouldn't wait. I'll bring my own. So Anthony, too, I forgot to mention Anthony. Thank you so much. We, we will connect. And uh, Leps here, he's uh, one of our professors that is big in this field. And I know he will be making connections with most of you. Thanking everybody for being here until the end. I know it's very late for some people, but you can agree with me. It's been a wonderful discussion, honestly, like so much to learn, insp inspirations. It's just good to be here. And, and this is why we created this African Tea Time. Initially, it was in person before COVID. COVID was not a good thing, but it just created these um, other ways of engaging engaging virtually especially and we've kept this even after COVID because we realized we we're able to engage uh, contributors and participants from other different parts of the world and it's growing bigger and better by that so I don't know if we will ever go back to in person we might want to do hybrid it hasn't worked we go hybrid and then everybody's on screen we tried it last year it never worked everybody was on screen except for the speakers who were in the room but um, anyway um, I, I'm really, really intrigued and fascinated. I want to thank Gishuki and Elud again for making this happen. You are friends of MSU and everybody here now is a friend of MSU. I have your emails. I Please pray with me that because I was disconnected a bit, I forgot to hook my power cable on. I hope the recording is intact. It will be shared with everybody here. And we look forward to continuing the conversation. Please be in touch. Uh, if you want to reach out to us or to the African Studies Center, you can email me or just go through Gishuki. You will find me. You will find me. I would have added my email here in the chat. Let me just do that. If you want to reach out to us, we, we will always provide space for discussions like this. Uh, let me just do that before I say bye-bye. Yes, and Dumaris also, as you mentioned, I just want to add something. Mm -hmm. Like, guys, please, now we are like a family. Mm -hmm. And we learn from each other. So I hope this group will stay like this. Just not today's meeting and then everybody's going, no, we need this group to stick together. We have a WhatsApp group. We want to be together. 
we want to keep in touch to continue communicating also share our ideas show different share different skills mm -hmm. i am the one who like to to know new people who like to learn new things to develop myself to grow as a person mm -hmm. that, that that that's and i think Bishuki you know knows that i mentioned this many times for Bishuki because he was here in egypt and you know i like helping people mm -hmm. i like to help my community even now in egypt i'm doing more voluntary job i'm teaching adults so mm -hmm. those who are, are, are not educating formal education because here it's, it's difficult to have uh, access for education mm -hmm. in government schools so i used to teach them english and i used to teach them other things my local language so i do this I'm not taking money. I also or I implement some sport activities, facilitating also for free without anything. I'm just doing this because I'm I am happy, you know. I'm enjoying doing help by helping people. Uh, so I learn from you different things. Maybe some of you have more experiences. Some of you are experts, like Pauline is national player and Yanga was also player and Elliot Gishuki. So you have more experience than me. So please, I want you to support me. To, to learn from you also, so I can get, take this message from you to give it to my community here in Egypt. Uh, thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Well, clearly we need these conversations to continue. I mean, we ran out of two hours, so let's find a way. We, we'll keep in touch. Let's find a way of, of continuing this conversation. We, we'll, we'll make it work. We'll make it happen. And thank you, um, staff and everybody, for all the contributions. I can't stop. I have to stop here now. By yeah, I'm, Damaris, I'm sharing something hmm. with Mustafa. Oh, okay. uh, oh. Muhammad, he, he's in Egypt, he's in Egypt. He's a basketball player. I met him in Kenya last year. So, um, if you can reach out to him with that email, I think that would be great to connect. Mustafa, mm -hmm. somebody at home where you are. Oh, yeah. good. So, do you have a phone number or just I can? Keep in touch no, I don't have email. I don't have his phone number. The email is on the chat box. Mm -hmm. So okay. um, yeah. He's in AUC American yeah. University. Right? Yes, America. Yeah, I think so. In Egypt. American University in Cairo. Yeah. So please reach out to him. And he's doing some youth work. He was at the conference in Kenya last year. But but is it okay, Domris, to ask people to just send their emails to you and then we compile this so that you know in the future we're looking for speakers. We're looking for people to be uh, to connect on various type of projects. We know who who is where. Yeah, I mean, this, actually, this actually really I have cool. everybody's email left. I have everybody's oh. email because they registered oh, to be here. Unless they have a different email that they would prefer, prefer to use. Perfect. Perfect. Otherwise, otherwise, thank you. Yeah. 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 Thank, thank you so you much. Time. Thank you. All right, let's finish here because we want to really be kind to those who need to go to bed right now. It's after time. But sincerely, on behalf of the African Studies Center and on behalf of Michigan State University, thank you for being here. And we look forward to continuing discussing this. Bye-bye.